The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you The Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti, Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. Join Martin as he conducts regular Q&A sessions on topics of interest to Christians serious about their faith. These Q&A sessions will continue to cover an ever-widening range of topics, all with an eye to honoring the command to let all things be done unto edification. more like it. Now we're touching base. Hello, it's Martin Sorbetti. I'm the Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation, and we are broadcasting from Round Rock, Texas today, uh, and have been for a little bit. Uh, and this is Chalcedon Q&A and a little meat of the word, where we take your questions in advance and uh, then move along with um, live questions at that point. So we had quite a bit of questions come in online, and so we're going to take these first. And what are they received? Hi, Andrea. Hi, Diane. There are those that say we need to take Genesis as a faithful account of how God created. Others say parts are figurative. How does the average person discern the difference between literal and figurative in Scripture? Often it can seem like a pick-and-choose mentality in many cases in line with a preconceived view of what has been taught by modern science and how that harmonizes with the Bible. So in effect what we have here is that modern rationalism, a uh, lust for credibility, uh, compels a lot of people to try to harmonize, which means bend the scripture to match science, except science is a moving target. Science is always provisional. It simply uh, pretends to be the arbiter of all truth, when in fact it's not, and certainly cannot make uh, truth claims about a God who is... Uh, uh, transcends uh, the modern universe, which is God's creation. So, um, the this has been a prevailing issue ever since uh, Darwin came on the scene, and some earlier earlier geologists who tried to uh, challenge the age of the world, the universe that's set forth in Genesis. In fact, the entirety of Genesis one through eleven has been alleged to be essentially fictional. And uh, so that school of thought says from Genesis 12 on, we can take that pretty seriously. But before that, no. And of course, once you've yielded all that ground, there is no basis for the authority of any scripture at that point. So you lose a lot in the process of um, compromising. Because if you're willing to compromise on where God starts the whole uh, mission and his testimony concerning his property, then of course, everything else is up for grabs. And it is a free-for-all. Uh, and therefore, we, uh, with Dr. Rushtuni, take the Genesis account very, very seriously. Uh, if uh, Ground Control could put up the uh, link to the book Genesis, Commentary in Genesis, by Dr. Rushtuni, uh, that would, uh, he speaks at some length about the rationalizers who have attempted to attack Scripture and to set it aside and to convince Christians to compromise on this point, to give away points. Uh, and the, that is a very slip, not a slippery slope. You're almost really at the bottom of the slope at that point. Because if you've given up 11 chapters of the Bible as a figurative and not realistic, then, of course, perhaps we can challenge the resurrection of Christ at the same time. And we have very little of the Bible left except ethical instruction, and even that's up for grabs uh, because people believe that's uh, evolving as well. So everything uh, rests on where we start. And if we fail to begin at the right place at Genesis 1-1, that God created the heavens and the earth, and all that in them is, then uh, we are on very, very shaky ground. We actually lay, took the word of man and level and put it on top of the word of God. And now God's uh, word is judged by man's verdict against it in the name of science, for example. Now, what is lost in the shuffle here, though some of you might be aware of it, is that quite a few scientists defend the biblical account. Uh, and, of course, that means that they are now targets, too, for both the Christians who hold otherwise and for the atheists. Now, we are not too surprised that the, uh, the evolutionists have stopped debating the creationists and have said well, all we want to do is ridicule and mock them. But now we're seeing similar intimations arise among old earth creationists, 
where I've uh, read in several groups within the Facebook community that we are no longer going to uh, talk toe-to-toe -to -toe with a young earth creationist. We're going to simply mock and be derisive toward them. They uh, deserve no respect whatsoever. Uh, they are liars, in effect. So they bring a moral imprecation against the young earth creationist and attack them. Uh, and of course, wisdom dies with the old earth guys who believe as Darwin did because they're trying to mix things that don't fit. An oil and water mix would be in, in a long age of the universe and the uh, biblical account. So a lot to be said in this regard. And it surprises me to see Christians who name the name of Christ, who hold to the old earth position, which I believe is an error, but instead of talking through the issue, uh, they uh, are now saying that they are no longer going to debate, no longer going to talk, they're simply going to uh, demonize. That's very much like um, Mel White did in his book, Religion Gone Bad, where he attacks um, a conservative approach to scripture, and he says, we're not going to debate this anymore. We're simply going to uh, uh, go on the attack against them. We're going to picket their churches. We're going to do this, that, and the other. The time for discussion is over. The second you say the time for discussion is over, it means that you're now taking up weighty mess, uh, worldly weapons, swords and things like that, or at least the um, social media equivalent of a sword, and off you go. You're going to go um, make someone uncomfortable. You're going to show that they are beneath contempt and they are certainly not worth talking to. They are to be attacked. And so when you um, consume one another and devour one another in this way, there's not much good to come of that. So you need to hold your ground in this one key point and don't lose faith. It's very easy just to um, look at some material written about the age of the earth or some piece of evidence and it can seem very, very compelling, but you need to catch the other side. You need to have that other side examining, searching it out. I'm going to actually be talking about Proverbs 18 and 17 in a little bit, too, in another context. It says the first person presenting his case <coughs> seems, <coughs> seems right, uh, but his neighbor comes and he searches him out, he examines it, <coughs> puts him to the test. And that's... Uh, Actually, well, the very thing that's not to be, uh, that's uh, now going to be a closed door. <coughs> Think about it. If um, an old, 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 earth, old earth creationist was um, successful in debating, would he not continue to debate and uh, let his um, debating skills and his knowledge of the facts do his talking for him? Uh, no, in actual fact, I think the reason that they don't want to talk is that they don't look good. It's the very reason that um, the early evolutionists <coughs> decided, hey, we got to stop debating the creationists. They make us look bad. They keep, quote, win winning these debates, and we know they're wrong, and we just need to prevent uh, uh, the discussion. We need to stop the discussion. We certainly shouldn't publish, discuss it in public because then we look bad. It's an optics problem, as they call it today. So, so, so too here. So uh, at Chalcedon, we are very, very strong on the uh, taking the Word of God seriously. To the law and the testimony, they speak not according to these, is because there's no light in them. And so the testimony that Moses gives there, we need to speak according to it. And that doesn't mean bending it or using all sorts of um, linguistic, um, <clears throat> fancy um, theories to try to explain away uh, the first chapters of Genesis or to try to find inconsistencies with it. Uh, they, they don't exist, but if you are not skilled in grappling with some of these attacks, you can become a prey to the disputer of this age. And it's our mission at Chalcedon to try to provide information, provide in, in equipment, equip you to better handle these things toe-to-toe -to -toe and understand the dimensions of this particular debate. And it's going to be an ongoing one. It's still uh, there, but it, it's not turning nasty on account of the young creation, earth creationists, but it is turning nasty on the side of some of the old earth creationists who have lost all patience with anyone taking the Bible seriously. <coughs> Excuse me. Second question. There are a number of cases where laws are in place to protect people that then are turned around to hinder them. An example is the freedom of religion in the First Amendment. What was meant to protect citizens from a tyrannical state is now turned around to oppress the free expression of religion. My question has to do with the spousal privilege of husbands and wives not being forced to testify against each other in order to preserve the sanctity of their marriage. 
Is it biblical to forbid a spouse from testifying, or is that an example of something being used contrary to its intent in order to subvert justice? Now, the issue here, as Dr. Reshton, he does when, uh, mentions when he deals with this topic in institutes and elsewhere, is that the uh, unity, unity of the uh, father, I mean, of the um, husband and the wife being one flesh, that is such a close community that uh, they're treated as almost one person. The two are one, in effect. And therefore, the biblical laws against self-incrimination would apply to your wife incriminating you. So uh, if it has to do with any kind of charge against the husband that doesn't involve the wife, <laughs> insofar as, you know, it's, it's different than, say, a, 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 the wife saying, you know, he, he, uh, he killed our son or something like that. At that point, it's a different ballgame. We have a covenantal breach within the family and that oneness doesn't exist. But insofar as that, that, um, that community within the family exists, then you cannot then uh, compel the wife to testify against the husband because this is considered self-incrimination. So the laws against forcing someone to testify against themselves would then apply to uh, trying to compel their wife to testify against them. There would be a built-in protection there uh, that would be of, of biblical import. There is a biblical basis for that position. That basis falls apart if the two people uh, in conflict are the husband and wife, um, because then her testimony may well have some merit and wouldn't necessarily be compelled. She'd probably be more than anxious to uh, bring it to light. But that's the basis for the principle that uh, Rashtuni brings out, is that uh, when your wife is compelled to testify against you, that is a form, and it's not that uh, the two of you are at war, wife and husband, but some other th related third-party issue, then this um, negates the protection against self-incrimination because the unity of the husband and wife, that community, that uh, one fleshedness is that complete and total. And that earlier law, law systems acknowledge that. Now, modern American law, based on statute that floats and expands and stretches, uh, is a whole different ballgame, but that's the other point. I was going to also comment on why is it that these laws get subverted <clears throat> uh, for a different purpose than intended. And we see this in Psalm 94, verse 20, right? The wicked frame mischief using law. And we also quote from that passage in Ecclesiastes where uh, it said that God made man upright, but men set out, uh, uh, search out, or seek out many inventions, many devices, many contrivances. The same idea there. So any way we can bend the law and pervert it, we, we do to do that. And one way to do it is to be partial in the law. Uh, and that's what Jesus caught the Pharisees doing continually. Uh, and the Sadducees on one key occasion, not using the law properly, as it, it, which means you need to use the whole entirety of the law. Every jot and tittle applies. The whole counsel of God must be laid onto a topic, and only then are you guiltless of the blood of all men, because you've not failed to proclaim and observe the whole counsel of God, the entirety of it. You cannot uh, pick and choose and bathe the smorgasbord, because he talked about this um, testifying and picking what suits you. And that's, of course, uh, the issue here in this case. Regarding the subject of the penalty for perjury, what if a case of slander or untrue testimony ruins another person's career or standing in the community and is later discovered to be the case that they were a victim of a fraudulent uh, prosecution? <clears throat> How would a just penalty be assessed? Now, if your reputation or your career is... Uh, uh, cut short in such that all your earning capacity for that period has been abridged, doesn't exist anymore, and then your reputation is of at least equivalent value to, say, uh, your right arm in doing work. And therefore, one can argue, therefore, that the lost revenue from that effect would <coughs> uh, be a legitimate thing um, in terms of uh, equality of the penalties to be exacted on the person who uh, by known false testimony has rendered you incapable of earning because you've lost your job, you've lost this capacity. Even if you were to be restored to that capacity, they're not going to necessarily pay you back wages. Uh, who's going to be covering that when it was done by someone else's lie? Uh, so here we're at the biblical principle of the use talionis, the, uh, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, the notion of proportionality of judgment would say and then that the other person would reasonably be expected to uh, have that um, leveled against them as something to pay to you. As far as reputation itself, 
once the uh, case is reversed, what would happen normally is that the individual is now shown to be a uh, false witness. Uh, their reputation would suddenly be sunk, and yours would be, in essence, uh, redeemed and restored, restored whole again. And uh, under that circumstance, then I think that would take care of itself. But if there are monetary uh, penalties involved uh, that you pay a, a high price on your pocketbook for someone having lied about you, uh, and that being a known perjured testimony, then, then the penalty would be reversed. Uh, insofar as it would be very similar to the case where if you uh, fight someone and you um, end up damaging their arms so they can't work, they can't, and the, now you have to make up the lack because of your action. So too, an action of a lie can have, in fact, a similar penalty. Now, I'm not saying that once for all um, ex cathedra is God's law. I'm saying the scripture appears to allow for that, and therefore this needs to be examined and worked out in more detail so that uh, we have a more solid answer. But I believe that the direction that uh, scripture always takes is about the restitution of all things, that what Christ is uh, all about. Uh, is that uh, he, the heavens must contain him until the time of the restitution of all things, uh, which is in Acts 3.21. Therefore, what he's all about is restitution and uh, reconciliation. And so the restitution to the injured party would require uh, the restoration of the lost income uh, that would have arisen from perjured testimony, meaning that he got fired un uh, without cause, without actual cause. So it's an interesting question. But again, the Bible talks about balancing out the accounts and restoring that which was lost, in this case, through a lie. If, it's, um, if there's a uh, civil penalty involved, then that, would, of course, would be reversed onto the perjurer. But here we have something a little bit more uh, interesting, where it's not so much that the judge said you're going to lose your job, but rather the employer says, I don't want to um, continue to have this person work for me, seeing that he's been charged again. Uh, guilty of this offense. You know, he's a felon or something like that. I don't want him to be uh, working for me anymore. Turns out he was not a felon. He, didn't, he was innocent of the offense, but now he's gone, whatever, five months of work because someone lied. So who's going to pay the difference? The liar should pay the difference. I'll get to uh, Josh's question once we get through all these other ones, but I'm uh, seeing that we have questions coming up that are live, and we will get to them. This one may be, not be of interest to general audiences on Sunday afternoons, but I have not found statutes word for word from the books of the law set to music that I can play for kids in the car. After a year of thinking about it, I've written exactly one, as far as melody and basic chording, regarding the enemy's ox or donkey. Next, I'm after the bird's nest. That would be Deuteronomy 22, uh, 6 and 7. I love that one. Before I get too much farther on this project uh, uh, at the herd of turtles' rate, do you have any thoughts about Bible version or anything else I should consider? I am beginning with children in mind, aiming for twinkle, twinkle, simplicity, simplicity, if possible, and with a melody that can be sung in the backyard without accompaniment. I began with the ESV, English Standard Version. So let's talk about this. Uh, what she's making reference to is in Psalm 119, verse 54, the second half of the verse says, Thy statutes have been my songs in the days of my pilgrimage. In other words, in the uh, uh, Psalter, David makes reference to the fact that the laws of God were versified and sung by Israelis to enable them to be memorized and uh, understood in the heart, in other words. So the people would grasp them and keep them in their hearts. And what the writer of this question is saying, I want to fill this gap because though maybe David was singing all the uh, laws of God, we don't have very many. Uh, Judy Rogers has done uh, several of them. The Ten Commandments tend to be the most easy target. But we see that she's picking ones about the enemy's ox or donkey being retur returned to your enemy. And then the bird's nest, things that tend to be more obscure and yet have meaning to God and to us if we would but know them. So I think the whole project is an excellent idea. It uh, puts us back on a footing where Psalm 119 verse 54 points us to, that the laws of God should be sung by God's people. How are you going to be theonomous if you're not singing God's laws? If they're absent from your part of your worship, why should they not be present? Because they certainly were present for David. And ha as the author of Psalm 119, he should know. <laughs> he spent 176 verses talking about the law of God. And he also points out that they were his songs. He sang them. He sang the laws of God. So this is a good thing. As far as the version of the Bible, I think it, um, they're all would be about the same value. Uh, the hardcore people would say King James only. Others might say use a Beck or a Moffat or a, a Smith Goodspeed, and there's all sorts of things 
uh, that one could criticize because of the Hebrew or the Greek text that it's based on. Um, so, but ESV would certainly be fine. And remember, as Williams pointed out when he talked about Psalm 119, he says the uh, laws were versified. In other words, they didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily possible to take them word by word and set them to music, but rather they could be uh, adjusted just slightly so that they would fall metrically within a melody and therefore the exact same sense would accrue and obtain, as we would say, and then uh, we'd run with that. And so uh, it doesn't matter what the version is, you may still need to make some adjustments. When I set um, Zechariah 14 to music, I made just some slight adjustments, but every part of the text is there. In fact, my version is closer to the original Hebrew than any English translation, believe it or not, at the benefit of uh, uh, using some uh, free translations from the Hebrew. So, she next asks, to incentivize young people with more talent to write music, are there payment considerations for contests? If you don't win the prize, you will have expanded your own portfolio type of thing. Is this ethical? The first thing we should point out is that Levites were paid to minister in music. Uh, it's right there in 1 Chronicles 25 uh, and uh, verses 8 and following in particular. Uh, they, were, they were trained, but they were also paid. There was money laid aside for a music ministry, and uh, but the music ministry was focused on the things of God and the law of God. Uh, and that was the purpose of the Levites because, as uh, Malachi says, the people of God were to seek the law at the lips of the priest, at the Levite. Uh, and that would be true whether they're singing or whether they're otherwise... Um, uh, ministering. So uh, from a, as a Levitical point of view, it is not unethical to pay, but there's a catch. <laughs> if you were going to have someone compose it, at least it was one of the, uh, in your group, you'd also have them teach the song to others. So it's not just, here's a sheet, piece of sheet music, off you go. Uh, where's, where's my Levitical money for that? It's rather now you have to teach others how to sing it and how to put it through. Uh, and then perhaps we could say it's not illegitimate to uh, incentivize that kind of thing. Now, from my personal view, and I'm not simply um, saying they're not worthy of their hire to um, write songs unto the Lord, I don't think David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms, was doing it for the money. Not evident to me <laughs> that there was any money in it, but he did it because he loved God and he loved the law of God, and uh, he loved the Messiah, and therefore uh, God used him as a vehicle for uh, putting out canonical Psalms. So uh, when we set these things to music, and particularly the law of God, which has not been set to music in a long, long time, and that's on us, that's our fault, uh, I would hope that uh, people are not holding up until they get the right uh, dollar amount for that. But it is appropriate to, when a Levite ministers, to go ahead and not see that they um, are hurting financially. Uh, this uh, plagued the people of God that they were not taking care of the Levites in their midst. They neglected the tithes. And consequently, the people that God set aside to equip them to be a godly people, they were starving. And that's not right. They were set aside for this purpose, and we've not gotten nowhere with it. Thank you, Calcedon, for the, uh, the link to Judy Rogers' album, which is an excellent way to start. Uh, and again, I have no objection to us setting the Ten Commandments to music. It's a very good place to start because they summarize the entirety of the law. Uh, also, the two great commandments are worthwhile. But we have, uh, once you've done those, you've got... 12, and there's 601 left to go. <laughs> so we need to do get busy. Uh, like this particular uh, inquiry says, she's already done the song about what to do about you know, finding an enemy's ox or a donkey. And she's working on the bird's nest uh, quotation next. So it's time to get busy, and I uh, applaud her efforts. This is good stuff. This is exactly what we need to see happening. Do you comment on the parapet law and the application for liability on the part of meth dealers, knowing, say, that their customers will be more likely to abuse their children while high on the product? Same question for car manufacturers, who know many will die from use of the product. However, there is the additional component of the tremendous advantages of motor vehicle use, dot, dot, dot. So uh, the parapet law, of course, is to prevent an accident from happening uh, where there is a, a potential risk uh, while you're up on the roof. Now using uh, methamphetamine or something like that, uh, or crystal meth or all of these horrible evil drugs out there, uh, the, the risk is intrinsic. There is no safe zone. There's no, no amount of parapets that's going to help you here. You're closer to having a poisoner, and not directionally I like to use that phrase uh, and, and translate that word in the Hebrew and also taken in the Greek in the Septuagint as a poisoner. You shall not tolerate a poisoner among you. Um, and that would potentially carry a death penalty in that regard. 
So the, that's um, more complex. And when you sell something uh, to somebody and then uh, they use it for an illicit purpose, uh, then what? Do we say, hmm, we saw a van go down this European city and it, uh, the person in the van tried to kill as many people as he could by mowing them down. We're going to sue the car manufacturer who made the van. Does that make sense? No, it was the man who was doing the killing. Uh, the vehicle was the vehicle, as they say. It was simply the means by which he would. And, and so lots of the creation is used and abused to, uh, um, as expedients for man's evil work. Look at that um, uh, gallows that was being constructed in the book of Esther. It was designed to put the innocent person to death, um, Mordecai, but, and, and as such it would have been an instrument of a murder. But it ended up being uh, used to slay Haman. So now uh, the uh, evil man is the one who actually dies on it. So it depends on what purpose the gallows is put to. If it's putting to death an innocent man, well, it's not the gallows' fault, uh, and it's put to uh, it's, it's not the fault of the wood in the cross that Christ was crucified on the wood or the nails. You know, these are just legitimate uses for the nail and the wood. Um, men's evil applies to everything. The whole creation groans in travail because of man's sin, and this is part of that function. So when you build a car, it's certainly a legal thing to build a car. Uh, it's not a legal thing in America to sell someone a dangerous drug uh, so that they can kill themselves or abuse their children under the influence of it. So there's uh, the place where you place the parapet, I think, would need to be defined with all the facts in line. And then we have the question whether um, when the government says we want to force you to wear a seatbelt, and the car manufacturers to put the seatbelt in, and in fact to make the car manufacturer prevent the car ignition from running unless the seatbelt is closed or is, is uh, clicked, click it or ticket kind of thing here in Texas. So now we have the state interfering and forcing the manufacturer of the car to make it, quote, a safer car. If you uh, read anything having to do with Eric Peters, who is a, uh, the car um, law um, gadfly who writes uh, and is featured on Lou Rockwell quite frequently, you'll see that a lot of the so-called safety laws are anything but. Uh, and, and as a libertarian, he happens to uh, take that tack and prove his case uh, quite uh, profoundly and pointedly. So there's a lot to be said about what is good for a car and not good for a car. A lot of folks believe that an um, airbag is more dangerous than it is, and does more harm than good, and yet the government's going to insist on airbags. And a lot of people will say, what can I do to disable that thing? And for a while, people were getting airbags that uh, would explode um, metal sh uh, shards into their face, uh, the Dakota airbags that were in a whole bunch of vehicles throughout the, uh, <laughs> uh, like the 2013 Passat I drive had a Takata airbag that's exploding shrapnel in your face. Uh, fortunately, I had it replaced, but it was, you're driving around with the risk in front of you, right in front of you. There it is, you're holding the steering wheel and nine inches from your face is the potentially explosive shrapnel. There's certainly liability uh, aspects built into that. So if you're going to put a parapet, make sure it's not an exploding shrapnel parapet is my, my point here. Just saying. All right. This is an interesting one. Last Sunday, you stated that only 2% of sexual abuse allegations are false. Where does that statistic come from? Now, I tell you what it doesn't come from. It does not come from Susan Brown Miller and her use of the statistic, which uh, Michelle Malkin traced back to a 1974 judge's comment, which they can't pin down. And then Malkin goes on to say, the numbers are much higher. Here's a 41% number, and here's a 22% number. And then she uh, says the, the gold standard from her point of view, I'm using my word, not hers, it was the book False Allegations by uh, Turvey, Ms. Savino, and Maris in this particular uh, volume. And she says this puts the, the lie and gives you the truth. It does not. In fact, I'm going to call her out on uh, some of the things that she's saying. First point, when you say, where are my sources? Well, my basic source for a lot of this would be this monster tome here, written in 1989, now it's backwards here, Psychotherapist Sexual Involvement with Clients. Uh, and uh, there's about uh, nine of the authors of this 836 page book are PhD clinical psychologists and with, they're talking about actual cases. And that's where it gets interesting because the numbers that they have, uh, they have over a thousand cases and they had uh, 16 false allegations. At the chapter 11 is false or misleading complaints by Dr. Schoner and Dr. Milgram. 
and they deal with the, uh, the how to handle this particular situation. Because they're so rare, they went ahead and uh, took each of the cases and explained what was going on and why those cases were what they were. Uh, and it comes very, very interesting here uh, as to show you what that, um, what the basis for it is. Uh, and over and over again, when you get case after case, and they're all listed by name, they give the examples, uh, we come up with a number that's well under 2%. And I also mentioned last week that the, uh, I even have an example of a case where it was 0%. Now, let's talk about that. Why would I have, we have what's known as sampling error. Sampling error is a big problem, of course, in respect to any kind of statistics. Uh, if I um, pick my sample in a certain way, I can kind of steer the statistic in a way. And I saw this happening when people were debating the 2% uh, number on uh, Facebook back and forth ever since the Kavanaugh hearing, which I'm not going to talk much about today, other than some of the things I'm I, uh, outlining here, because that's a, a dumpster fire. Someone even put a picture of a dumpster fire on Twitter and said, here's a picture taken from the Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, very fitting. But you know, this is a part, this is maybe represents a third, this is a monster manuscript here. This represents a third of a single article that's going to appear in the Journal of Christian Liberty, which uh, I'm the supervising editor for. Kyle Shepard is the uh, uh, editor. And in it, uh, some time is taken out with specific cases of uh, uh, statistics from around the world. And before I get to that, let me explain what I saw on Facebook. Someone said, well, here's some statistics here in England. And the objector was, oh, well, in England, that doesn't matter because in England, if you caught uh, lying, there's uh, penalties for that. Over here, there's not. You can get away with it. And therefore, our statistics are not England statistics. In other words, uh, when someone asks the question, what is your, where'd you get that statistic, is an attempt usually to discredit the source of the statistic to say that statistic doesn't apply here, it's wrong, it's, and, and my statistic's right and yours is wrong, you have sampling error, my samples are correct. So let's be very clear. If you take a, for a sample in Wisconsin, a sample in California, a sample with a group of uh, pastors, uh, 1,100 pastors over here in the uh, Methodist area, these are Episcopalian, 800 pastors here, uh, uh, abuse cases alleged around them, each of these is a separate population. So what then arises is what do we have overall and therefore, overall, you could have a certain area where perhaps uh, there's uh, socioeconomic issues, there's um, uh, personality disorders that might be drug-induced in, uh, in the populations there, which increase the numbers. Other places where the numbers drop below the 1.5% area. Because like I said, we had here 1.6%, and there we have another whole area of sampling error. What's that? Underreporting. If it's underreported, then the actual number of victims is larger, and so how do you compensate for that? Well, you can't, really. You just have to take into account that the numbers are likely more severe than we're dealing with. Uh, but we can't put a number to it uh, because that would be illegitimate because you're trying to quantify. When you take, talk about it, quantifying something, that means you've got the numbers, you got the goods. But if you just have a supposition, then your ideolo ideology will drive the numbers. That's why people want to say, oh, 10% of the population is homosexual. That means that, there's, that uh, if they're that numerous, they therefore are, have a political force and therefore need to be dealt with at the level of having 10% of the uh, voting population votes that way because that's their, uh, how they are. And uh, that number, therefore, has a political meaning, and the same thing would happen with any one of these um, uh, approaches to uh, how many allegations are false when it comes to sexual harassment, abuse, rape, things like that. So the bottom line is uh, any given populace might have a particular number, What's the question across the board, at least for America? Across the board for America, it is 1.6% or lower. And uh, when I mentioned a, a statistic, and this is a bunch of uh, case after case that's being listed that's going to be appear in our journal. And by case, I mean a case to 300 ministers here, uh, 1,700 congregations here, 1,164 nuns by Chibnall, Wolf and Duck Rose study 1998, 2,500 women religious from 20, 123 congregations that are uh, Roman Catholic, goes through the list. And here's the one that I thought was interesting. This is from uh, James Evinger from 2001. Investigation and disposition of formal ecclesiastical cases of pastoral misconduct involving sexual abuse. Quantitative study. Journal, and it appeared in the Journal of Religion and Abuse, Advocacy, Pastoral Care and Prevention, Volume 2, Issue 4, pages 5 to 30. And uh, t talks about it. And in these cases, uh, it shows the number of uh, victims identified, uh, which is 32, the perpetrators, uh, and then finally, the, um, 
the accusations determined to be false was zero. So here we have a zero percent. Now, it's a smaller population, but it's more current than the one by Scherner, whose dates from 1989. People can say, well, that was 1989, things have changed. No, they have not that changed, because we wouldn't be getting zeros here, we wouldn't be getting numbers that match up uh, continually with the one to two percent, and there's not a single breath or mention of either Susan Brown Miller or the evidence that's provided by uh, Michelle Malkin's other reference. So when she says they scoured the literature and couldn't find any evidence of any number close to um, two percent, well, maybe if they found the zero percent number in the Avenger sites in this journal, uh, they'd say, oh, maybe that is pretty close. It's actually lower than two percent, and a lot of the numbers fly between that. Uh, and when we, especially the larger the sample, the closer we get to that figure. And so, because it's such a rare phenomenon, it was interesting to Scherner to say what causes people to lie under these circumstances. So they took the 16 cases over the out of the 1,000 plus cases that they dealt with, and said what, how, how was the, uh, what motivated the lie? What was a factor in it? And that's why they and put them through and bracketed those cases the way they did. So statistics can be very much misused. People uh, cite them, and therefore, if you're going to say, what are the clinical results by people who are actually in the field talking to the victims and dealing with the results, and you ask a question, well, how do they know that the person was guilty? Oftentimes, it turns out that the, the, uh, the perpetrator admitted guilt. That's one way. It certainly is. Now, uh, before we leave this topic, I wanted to quote something interesting I, I saw. This is from the, well, the book that's quoted in that, that article that's going to appear in the Journal of Christian Liberty, which is successor to the uh, Journal of Christian Reconstruction. Okay, where did I quote? Oh, yeah. oh, here we go. This is brief, but it's worth talking about because it means there's an interesting dynamic related to this that we should at least be aware of. It doesn't mean it guides us or, or paints or taints anything, but it means we should be aware of this fundamental inertia or lethargy that is built into us. When events are natural disasters or acts of God, those who bear witness sympathize readily with the victim. But when the traumatic events are of human design, those who bear witness are caught in the conflict between victim and perpetrator. It is morally impossible to remain neutral in this conflict. The bystander is forced to take sides. It is very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. He appeals to the universal desire to see, hear, and speak no evil. The victim, on the contrary, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. The victim demands action engagement and remembering. And uh, the example here uh, brings into uh, uh, Nazi concentration camps the cruel conflict of interest between victim and bystander, and the victims who perhaps wish to forget but cannot, and all the others who, uh, who unconscious motives who very intensely both wish to forget and succeed in doing so. Uh, the weakest one remains the losing party in this silent and unequal dialogue. So the point there is that there is a um, inclination toward the slothful thing, the inactive thing, and that's what we have to confront with this particular topic. So it, it strikes me as interesting that Michelle Malkin correctly says, you know, there's something ideological about where Susan Brown Miller got her 2% number. I, just, I agree with that. Uh, that was badly researched, but the implication is that there's no good research that shows that number is, is within the ballpark, in fact, on the high side, Michelle Malkin is dead wrong, completely dead wrong. And she can certainly acquire the volumes. It's not a uh, cheap one to buy, but you can get it. I actually have two copies of this particular big monster book in my library um, because I thought I'd lost it and it was so valuable I acquired a second copy and then I found the original. So it pays to look and check your uh, cabinets out. All right, back to the Q&As. Oh boy, this seems to be still related to um, Kavanaugh. But it's the last question and I'll take the live ones. Go back to Josh Wall's question. Another subject, perhaps in the Q&A, you could touch on the issue of believing a woman's accusation of sexual assault because she is a woman. I read comments by women that this is a biblical making reference to the case of sexual assault away from a populated area when no man can hear the woman scream. Though it does seem to argue for giving more weight to the weaker person in the conflict, would that not be something to be taken into account in a judicial proceeding? I was thinking about the examination of the woman accused of infidelity by her husband as a possible indicator that there is more here than meets the eye. Also, I read a comment that by the mere accusation of a woman, the man could be stoned for rape. That also seems to be an interpretation out of the context of the whole of Scripture. It would be interesting to hear your take on all this. Thanks, as always, from Roger Oliver. 
So first point is in Deuteronomy 117, we read that there should be no respect of persons. You cannot respect someone's uh, because they're a woman or a man, a rich or poor, a stranger or a member of the Israeli commonwealth. No respect of persons. So everyone is equal before the bar of justice. So uh, that is a fundamental premise of law, uh, of biblical law. Now, if there's anything that counterbalances that, then that needs to be taken into uh, account by the judge. Uh, and then the judge needs to then apply the wisdom to know what is and is not a valid um, counterweight to that. But if we have respect to persons, then we have a fundamental problem. Which brings us back to that interesting verse that we mentioned earlier, Proverbs 18.17. The first to present his case seems right, and, but another comes and examines him. The implication here is that the person, the word seems is not in the original Hebrew, I checked it, it's not. It actually says, the first uh, person's case is right, and then his neighbor comes and searches him out. In other words, examines the case that was just presented. This means, of course, that in the Kavanaugh hearings, the there was no application of Proverbs 18.17, because the two were not in the room at the same time. That was actually specifically requested by Dr. Ford's attorney. And I don't think Dr. Ford's attorney helped the matters any by saying that, and I don't think that the handlers for Kavanaugh helped them. We're getting farther and farther away from a biblical resolution or any application of this particular verse, because the two of them going toe-to-toe -to -toe would come closer to perhaps the searching out that would reveal the weaknesses in Kavanaugh's case versus having it done at a distance, um, second-hand, third-hand, through the handlers through this particular media circus, which is what it apparently boiled down to. So everyone has an ideological take on it, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's the way it is going to play when we are so far removed from biblical justice. We don't have uh, wisdom on the part, and there's no actual judge looking at this. This is being tried, in effect, in the media, and uh, being tried between the two parties who have an ideological stake in this particular Supreme Court justice. And therefore, because the two parties have a stake, I wonder if, um, the, if she is, in fact, a victim as she says she is and the way she says she is, uh, she's being dealt fairly in this process. Not likely that either uh, Mr. Kavanaugh or uh, Dr. Ford are being dealt with properly un with this process, uh, which is all the more tragic because we're going to navigate through it and assume that's the best that can happen, and that's regrettable in all respects. Okay, let's go back and take a look at the questions that were live. Josh Wall. It says Seymour, hit the Seymour button, and it will not let me see more. Let me pin the comment, maybe it'll help. Okay, now I can see it. I'll unpin it after. Is it a violation of God's law to take out a loan for a home or a loan for a personal home given our current economic system, banks, inflated dollars? Uh, Dr. Rushton is of the opinion that uh, um, all loans, no loan should be for frivolous matters. They should be for serious issues. If you have to repair a home uh, and it is a, cr uh, a critical issue for that home, that should not be taken lightly. So, uh, and then the seven-year rule would apply, um, or six-year if you want to wish, that the, um, that's as far as you can mortgage your future. So if you take out the loans for something that is a, a valid, um, legitimate, um, needful expense, and that cannot be handled any other way, then that would be a legitimate, it's not a violation of God's law. But to frivolously take it out so that we can have the widescreen TV is a whole different ballgame. So it depends on the actual source and use for it. Um, now, oh yeah, we are, well, the issue of course there is that yes, you are using inflated dollars and so that's why you want to pay down the loan within the biblical uh, requirement of the six years because uh, that takes it out of circulation and demonetizes the debt you know, within the time frame that God requires. Remember, uh, we're always, even in a gold or silver economy, people are still mining gold and mining silver, or <laughs> mining bitcoins for that matter. So uh, there is always a slight inflationary pressure, but because aggregate supply uh, is being increased because our technology is becoming more and more efficient, um, there should always still be a mild deflation under normal circumstances. So uh, it's more a matter of what the purpose of the loan is and it is uh, in respect to that because the Bible doesn't say just because you need something, 
you got to do without it. Oh, the, your water pump is get gone. Well, you guys are going to have to um, not have water in your house because biblical law. No, that's not how the Bible works. Uh, you can, in fact, acquire something for a important, critical emergency need that cannot otherwise be acquired uh, without that uh, that loan. But loans are to be taken as a form of sla ensla temporary enslavement, and you want to get yourself out of that as fast as you can. But when there comes a time for it, there comes a time for it. You can sometimes say there's a season for every purpose under heaven, and sometimes there's a time to take a loan, sometimes it's a long time to pay back a loan, sometimes to uh, issue a charitable interest-free loan to a Christian. One day we'll get to the point where those loans, we may actually um, excuse them on the seventh year as God's law requires. That'd be interesting. Okay, great. So uh, Bill Evans has a post about the Ten Commandments being put into song. Yes, I'm aware of uh, those guys. I see their, their posts all along. Okay, better link. The Good Shepherd Band. Okay, Bill Evans corrected his own link. I don't have to do any due diligence at all. He fixed it for me. Okay. And read the rest of it. I'll just have to pin it, I guess. Okay, Andy Eckert writes, Martin, it seems to me like Christians' aversion to Christian Reconstruction is deeply presuppositional, and I wonder if perhaps none of them ever become Reconstructions on the basis of CR exegetical and theological arguments. Rather, only if they first come to see and hate the evil consequences of their pietist presuppositions, for example, injustice in the, and I can't see the rest of it. Wish I could. But I get the, the, the gist of this. So let me close that out. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that is... I am seeing more of it. They come to see and hate the evil consequences of their pietist presuppositions, injustice in the world, and are willing to totally uh, th uh, throw those presuppositions out. Are they then subject to being subsequently swayed to the uh, CR paradigm? What do you think about that? Thank you, uh, Ground Control. Also, uh, gave me the rest of the quote. Uh, why are people opposed to taking every thought captive to the beings of Christ? Why are they opposed to receiving five talents and giving the Lord back ten? Uh, excellent message by Mark was just preached on Matthew 24, 14 through 26, 16. And he deals a little bit with the parable of the talents and, uh, and the nature of the person who preferred to bury the talent, which involved very little effort on his part, it was a lazy option, and giving back what he already got. Uh, and the Lord regarded this as slothful, the wicked and slothful servant. And then slothfulness, therefore, has a moral component to it. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes people oppose Christian Reconstruction. He says, well, if you're right, everyone else is doing it wrong, and they're culpable for it. Uh, and that's, that's strong medicine. Bottom line is a strong medicine. But, you know, God is the same God that wrote Isaiah 42, that, you know, the bruised reed he will not break, the, the smoking flax he will not quench. You know, he deals with us in our weakness and gets, wants to strengthen us. He does not want us to stay in that lazy, slothful state. So he, that's why there are all these warnings in Scripture to incentivize us to action, to girding our loins and to be salt. Because we realize if you're not salt, what are you? You're going to become... Um, asphalt on the ground. You're thrown out and trodden underfoot of men like uh, ground cover. That's not a good place to be for the Christian. You know, we have a calling. We're not to hide the light under the bushel. And CR is very almost strident, if you want to say it that way. Uh, certainly is bold to say we need to take the whole counsel of God seriously and apply it in our lives, first and foremost our own lives, and then that can spread out from there. People will see your good works and glorify God. And uh, that has an evangelical effect. I tell you what people actually see when they uh, look at Christian Reconstructionists is everyone fighting. They see uh, something they don't want to be part of. I don't blame them one bit. It's interesting, I got a note from um, Australia, from the folks that put on the Daniel 244 conference, and uh, asked how the conference went this year where Dr. Joseph Boot did the... Uh, the lectures. I was there in 2017 was the key lecturer there. And uh, he made a comment and he said um, the number, we still have a problem getting numbers to these conferences. He says because uh, too many Christians in Australia have a very lightweight, lightweight faith and those who do not are serious about their faith are not enthusiastic about working with each other. And there you have it in a nutshell. When people see that, that's all they need to know. So if by their works they know us and our works look pretty ugly, 
Uh, that's probably going to go a lot farther than them saying, well, who's got the answers? Um, now, it's true there are those who will take a look at the world and say certainly there must be an alternative to what we're seeing here. Uh, and wait, are we doing on time? No, we have 11 minutes. Okay. I just saw a notice from Ground Control that kind of struck me as uh, sending, telling me time to go. But we're not quite time to go. Uh, we, it's true that, Cal that the enemy and Christian Reconstruction uh, put out not necessarily answers, but the route of the answer. Dr. Rushton always said he was scratching the surface. He was laying out the groundwork so that someone else could be um, take go through the same trails that he was blazing. He's a trailblazer, pioneer. Pioneer is the guy with the arrows in his back. That's Dr. Rushton. He plenty of arrows in his back, uh, starting with his fellow OPC ministers <laughs> back in the 70s, and then following through uh, up until the point that he passed away uh, and entered into glory. Uh, still under attack today, posthumously, uh, and, uh, with vehement, vicious attacks. Uh, but at least he held the ground, and he gave us a legacy to build on, and therefore it's our obligation to take that and extend it. We don't want to have happen what happened to the law of God in ancient Israel's period of time, where it ended up being a scroll hidden in the wall of the temple that Hilkiah the priest has to find and bring it to the king to read it at which point the king tears his clothes and says, oh my goodness, we're in world of hurt. God's going to blow us away for the bunch of his laws we've been breaking and trampling underfoot. But we're lawless at heart. Uh, the American Christian is a sleeping giant, in effect. And until we wake up the sleeping giant, we're going to continue to have these questions. How do we strategically get to these folks uh, if we can't even uh, talk to each other peaceably? We can't work in tandem. We can't work with one shoulder, using that phrase, in Zephaniah 3, 19. Uh, we're, uh, and that's why it's important to um, weigh your battles. Determine which hill is important to die on before you go out there to die on it. Uh, and if you don't, then, of course, we'll be dying on pointless hills. And Satan will say, but that was easy to derail that. I just got him busy on his little thing that made him so excitable, and he's off there fighting in the sticks and in in, off in the weeds. And we can get off in the weeds very, very good. So if you don't make the main thing the main thing, to quote a popular book from a bunch of years ago, uh, and major in the minors, you're going to have a fundamental problem. So we need to do as Warfield did. Warfield was very good at extending the hand across the aisle to his fellow Christians. Uh, and to the extent that he was successful in it, at least he tried. Uh, and to the extent he was successful in it, uh, it modeled what we should be doing today. And if we don't do that, shame on us. So that's what um, Chalcedon is all about. To continue to build the bridges and to continue to build. And after all, the scripture is very clear, they that shall be of thee shall build. What shall we build? The old waste places. Well, that's not a good place to build. Why can't we build something pretty in a nice area? No, we're to build the old waste places, the old cesspools, raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shall be called uh, the repair of the breach, the restorer of the past to dwell in. This is Isaiah 58, 12. Uh, that's a song that I, uh, a portion of scripture that I set to music myself because I thought it was such an important per, a part of scripture uh, that you know, we should be singing that because that should be our, our mantra, if you will. I don't have too many texts that I regard as a litmus test, but that would come close to it. They that shall be of thee shall build. If you're not building, what are you? What are you doing? What, are you just holding some ground? you got a buried talent that you're standing on top of? Let's put, dig the talent up and let's put it into play and let's change the world. As Rashtuni said, we should not, we did not come into the world, um, the world was not empty when we came into it, and it shouldn't be empty of us having passed through it. We should leave behind something that makes it a better world than when we entered it. And if that was through our children, or our children's children, or through some other means by which we bless the uh, growth of the kingdom of God, so be it. But that's important. Uh, if we uh, miss the out on that, then all our wonderful theological debates and papers that we write are going to be meaningless. God's going to look at that and say, where were you when the rubber hit the road? All of this is intended for application. That's why I liked uh, Mark's Rushtuni's Rush message, because he pointed out that uh, the discussion of the prophetic uh, fate of Jerusalem was not for its own sake, but rather to incite action. He, uh, Jesus applies the thumbscrews of application. He doesn't let us uh, squeeze away and say, that's nice. We'll hear this later. No, he says, now, what are you going to do about it? Jesus always has ethical impression in mind, and he pushes that on us. 
is in our face. He said, well, and uh, that's important to realize that uh, we are, have a duty. We are men and women under orders, whether we acknowledge it or not, we are. And we're going to be held accountable for those orders. You cannot say, I didn't know I was supposed to be. Uh, I was just following the flock. Well, weren't you told not to follow the multitude in any regard? Shouldn't follow the multitude into slothfulness or into lawlessness. Uh, you need to, and you're responsible to what God says. And so the Word of God is there as a plumb line. It's the way to show how to build straight, straight and true. And that plumb line is very important. As I've said and I've lectured on it many times, when they're rebuilding Jerusalem, what do they got? God, God, inform, God informs Zechariah that the plumb line, which is a piece of tin stone on a string that is in the hand of Zerubbabel, God's seven eyes are on, this, on the plumb line because it's being used to build everything straight according to God's requirement as they rebuild the new Jerusalem uh, in very difficult circumstances, it should be pointed out. So Nehemiah is the book of Reconstruction. And... Uh, what happens in Nehemiah? The people catch the vision of the leaders. The leaders were united. Uh, they were God word united, united on what God expected and wanted, and they focused on what God required, and they saw to the people's needs. And they were not distracted by what Tobias and Sanballat were saying to try to distract and derail God's work in their midst. So we don't have that today. Uh, there are too many people pulling in too many directions, and that is not going to get us where we want to be. If you want to emulate the kind of success that Nehemiah had, you need to put in the ingredients that led to those success. You can't get there from here because you uh, cannot make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. So pray that God transforms our hearts to make us pliable, clay in his hands. Use us, O Lord. Use us. And until that happens, uh, if we're going to say, I have too many objections to my brothers around about and all the Christian reconstructions, I'm angry with all of them. They're all compromised in some way, shape, or form, and I'm going to maintain my purity. And the kingdom of God is just going to on that very moralistic basis. And that's going to be on us. And God doesn't mind waiting a generation. You know, he was able to wait out 40 years while that generation died and the bones bleached in the wilderness, and only Joshua and Caleb made it across the River Jordan. So... If we want to be like those who died in the wilderness, we have a pretty good head start on that. Therefore, those warnings that are laid out in the book of Hebrews and the book of Numbers uh, and 1 Corinthians 10, for that matter, uh, should resonate in our hearts. They should be preached. So we have blind guides uh, in the pulpits of America, and that's the second biggest problem we have. Uh, and therefore, the people are led. There's a quote, I think it's, um, what was it, John uh, Upton Sinclair said it. It's very, very hard to uh, get something, someone, I'm going to paraphrase it, someone to believe something when disbelieving it, uh, uh, very hard to get someone to believe something if uh, disbelieving it is the key to his paycheck. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you say oppose public schools, uh, you're going to have a hard time making that case with someone who is a public school teacher. In the famous case, the pastor whose wife is a public school teacher, that pastor is not going to be inclined to uh, confront educational requirements for God's people in a way that's meaningful. So, how are we doing on time? Well, we've got two minutes left. Yes, there'll be no Q&A because I will be in Reading, Pennsylvania next week at the uh, MARS conference. MARS stands for Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society. Uh, I was there last year as a breakout speaker. This year I'm one of the two um, plenary session speakers along with Dr. Paul Michael Raymond. And we're talking about um, education. I'll be speaking about the importance of education in the present, and my second message will be on education in the future. And uh, pray for us then, and we will see you back October 14th for another Q&A. Uh, thank you all for listening, and if there's anything else from uh, from our friends there at uh, Gun Control, we're going to close up shop today, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you again for your help, and all your free support for Cal Seton. Good night, or good afternoon. We do have listeners on the other side of the, the equator and the other side of the world for that matter. Talk to you all later. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti. We pray that you have been edified by the content that you've heard on this episode. Please visit calcedon.edu for some great resources and reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks. Until next time, 
May the Lord richly bless you in all that you do.